All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Alexis Gladstone, who is in Chicago. How are you doing, Alexis? I'm doing great. As we said, it's sunny. So when it's sunny, we're all happy here. Very true. And well, we're happy most of the time here. So that's... <laughs> can I say? Um, and Alexis is an extensive background, uh, an expansive background in talent leadership training and development and is a principal with Intellead. And what we want to talk about today is, so there's an awful lot of change, some of it driven by the pandemic, some of it driven by business change, uh, technology advances, automation, all of those things. So it's, it seems like we're in a period of accelerated change. And I think most people would agree with that. However, I don't think everybody understands the best way of approaching and managing uh, change within an organization and especially how to lead change. And I know that's one of the things that you work with your clients on. So, so let's, let's just dive into it right now. What, what do you think the, the biggest challenges are around uh, managing change, particularly in an environment where maybe people are feeling a little vulnerable at the best of times? Well, you know, we always say that change fails because it's the people and mm -hmm. it's the people from the standpoint of, you know, a lot of times organizations are like, well, if we change, if we build it, they will come, they will just follow us. And those of us who have been in business long enough and have seen a lot of change, we know that's not true because people need to understand what's going on and people need lots and lots and lots of communication. And that's really, if, if I said it came down to one thing, it's communication. Yeah, and, and, I, and I agree. But unfortunately, I think some of the times the communication is, uh, is like, here's what we're going to do and here's what you need to do. And, and I don't think sometimes enough effort is put into really painting the picture of why and where, where the destination is. Absolutely. You know, when I work with my clients on this, I have, among all the things that I do with them, the communication plan, if we stick on that for a moment, is always about you're communicating often, and you're communicating also what's in it for them. So I always kind of have this roadmap of, first, you have to tell the story. You know, as we all know, stories are really important in business these days. And it's the story of why we're doing what we're doing how it's going to help and what's in it for everybody in the organization, which might not be everything, something that makes everybody happy, but there's something in it for everyone. So you need to come figure out that story and communicate it. And you need to communicate what's going on along the way. So you can't just say, oh, we've started and oh, we've ended. There has to be strategic communication along the way of what's the story, where are we, what's in it for you, how are you helping, what are our successes so far, what have been our wins, what have we messed up, but we're learning from. All of those things need to be part of the communication. Yeah, and, and I think uh, the, the, I agree with everything you said, and I think the important thing that sometimes is overlooked is the fact that uh, Whenever change, you know, we're all self-centered at the best of times. And, you know, when when a change is announced or, or even talked about, we default to, OK, how's that going to affect me? What's good? So we, we get kind of vulnerable. And I think that that is the part, as you said, you have to address it. What's in it for everybody? Yeah, it may not. It may not be what everybody wants. It may not be what they like. And maybe, you know, later on, maybe it's not what they want uh, ultimately. And they they have to go somewhere else. But. I think that addressing that elephant in the room up front is so critical. Well, I think it's also what you just said, John, it's also recognizing that people do go through a process and everybody, you know, what, whatever process you look at, you know, in terms of, you know, you start out, people are, like you said, they're apprehensive. They don't know what's going on. They don't know if they want to go along for the ride. And so you have to let them go through their process of hearing about it, maybe kind of fighting against it a little bit, and then helping them come out. If you kind of look at it as, as a dip, helping them come out on the other side and as leaders, that's what's really important that it's incumbent upon us to help people through that and to know that I might be going through it at a different pace than you're going through it. So I have to be adaptable as, a, you know, the leader has to be adaptable in terms of, okay, John is here, Alexis is here, I need to help them differently. 
Yeah, and I think that's a really critical point here that you just touched upon there, not just for change management, but just in general. I think uh, nowadays more than ever is, is different people like to be communicated to in different ways. I mean, once upon a time, you could probably just put out a memo and you know that pretty much covered everything. Not saying that it suited everybody, but that's just the way it was done. Today, people consume information differently. They need to be communicated differently too. And I think that's one of the biggest challenges of leadership is understanding that one form of communication, one size does not fit all. Well, it's not only one size doesn't fit all, it's also when you're delivering the message might be different and, and you have to kind of be attentive to that. You know, some people, you know, think about how, when we're most productive in the day, some people are morning people and they're going to hear a message differently in the morning than they are when they're tired at the end of the day. There's all of those little nuances as leaders, as we adapt our style, like you said, in communication in general, in delivering good news, bad news, whatever the case may be, performance coaching, all of that is how can we meet the individual where they are, just like you do in sales with your prospects and clients. Yeah, I think that's a that's an excellent uh, that's an excellent analogy to to bring up. And I think the the other part of this too is that uh, I think on, honesty and transparency is is key as well. Because when you start on a change initiative, I mean there are there are there are many unknowns, and I think that's one of the things that you also have to communicate up front is like, here's where we're going, here's the plan, here's what we know. Now here are some of the things that we don't know. Well, it's all, yeah, it's all about being authentic and saying, hey, we don't have all the answers and we're going to learn some of this along the way and willing to be vulnerable as a leader. Yeah. Because and really say, I don't, I might not know, but you know what? I'm either going to get the answer or we're going to figure it out and then we'll all have the answer together. Yeah. What I used to always say to people when I, when I ran the companies uh, that I ran was I said, if you ask me a direct question, I'll give you a direct answer. If I know the answer, if I don't know the answer, I'll tell you. And if I'm not allowed to tell you, I'll tell you that too. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And I think the, the other part as well is as part of the change process. And you've probably seen this is once it's underway, sometimes things don't go well oftentimes things don't go that smoothly and maybe there's a few snafus at the beginning and you need leadership particularly leaders to be strong enough to manage through that as opposed to you know when people go oh well you know we should just go back to the old way or this isn't working or this is a disaster you know because we love all that stuff you know human nature being what it is well i've also seen leaders pointing fingers at each other well i wasn't part of of, <laughs> of that discussion or i wasn't part of you know that that's a different part of the project that's not mine versus putting forth the united front whether you're the leaders all the leaders that are part of it or whether you're just on that team that's implementing the change it all has to be a united front and united messages because it's not them it's us together yeah, and, and I think the other part, too, is that I, I think it's important for people to understand, you know, that change is an ongoing process. It's it's rarely do you flick a switch and everything changes overnight. It's an ongoing process. And I think sometimes, you know, we have that expectation, okay, we'll just go through this process quickly, get it over with, and then we'll be at the new state and everything will be good. But that's not how things work, especially nowadays. Absolutely. It, you know, it's that those steps along the way. I mean, and, and it depends on, as you said at the beginning, how big is the thing that's being changed? You know, how big is the technology implementation or how big is the rebranding or whatever the case may be of whatever this change is um, that impacts how long it takes. It impacts who's, who's along for the ride and it impacts, do we do it in little pieces? Do we do a big bang? All of those different things. And people need to know that and understand that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think one of the other parts uh, about change that's that's often overlooked is, uh, I mean, naturally as humans, right? I mean, I, this is always baffles me, but we're all guilty of it. It's like life, life is full of change. It's unpredictable. Things come, you know, left, right and center at us. But we go into work and we suddenly go, OK, I can control this. Everything can be neatly put in boxes. Everything can be neatly controlled. And it's and it's, of course, that's nonsense. But somehow we have to overcome that mindset and realize that, you know, life happens in work just the same as everywhere else. Right. It, you know, and I I'm wondering and I've seen it a little bit, though, not, com you know, not complete change. But with the pandemic, as you mentioned, you know, the fact that people realize that work is not that stable. Yeah. 
box, as you said, that, that it once was, and people are a little bit more accepting, except now that I think we're moving into this hybrid world that people are in, we're still trying to figure out. And it's another change put on top of all the change that we've been through. It's okay, so how do I fit into this box and how do I fit into this new world? And we need to all figure that out together. And it is a change, even if it's not a formal change, if the organization isn't, a make, isn't making it that way, it's still something that as um, leaders, it should be discussed with your team and it should maybe even be mapped out and setting the ground rules and how we're going to operate and all of that can really go a long way. Yeah, no, great. I'm glad you raised that because uh, the, the whole virtual hybrid organization, I think that's another great challenge because if you're, if you're uh, even moving to a hybrid organization, as you said, is a change in itself. But it also means that going forward, you have to figure out how do I communicate with an organization with maybe some people are here, some people are remote, some people are here sometimes. And maybe I have remote contractors too, because I think that people overlook too, the hybrid organizations and the organizations of today and tomorrow are going to have some full-time employees. Some of them will be maybe in physical offices. Some will be in there sometimes, some will be fully remote. And some people will be variable resources from outside contractors because there's so many specific skills you need nowadays right. that you sometimes don't need them full time. So I think that the organizational challenge is a very big one. Absolutely. And to being able to take a step back and really look at it from, you know, a team level all the way up through the organizational level, depending on the size of the organization that you're in, I think is really important. And also realizing if it is a larger organization, that one size is probably not going to fit all in terms of the different functions in the different departments across the organization, because that some will be able to be more remote. And some, as we know, are not not going to be and haven't even been all through the pandemic. So again, you know, trying to figure that piece out and trying to figure out and, and communicate and bringing the people into the conversation and so they don't feel done on to. I think we're all have been done on to enough from forces outside for the past almost two years that anybody who can really bring their team members into the conversation so they feel part of it and included and valued, I think is going to really help some of the other issues that are going on that we're not even talking about with the great resignation and things like that. Yeah, and and I think uh, I think that's that's a great point, and I and I do think that people, having gone through what everybody's gone through for the past uh, couple of years, and and it is the first global experience I think the world has ever had, because even world wars weren't didn't affect everybody, um, not every country, not every continent, but uh, certainly this is a shared experience, and I think maybe people are a little tougher, more resilient probably now than they were two years ago, and more likely to you know push back on things. So I, 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 I agree with you. And I think there's a real danger here, and this is what I think there's a danger for organizations, is that you end up with tiers of employees, right? So you sort of, yeah. even unconsciously, you go, people in the office, they're my core. People who are remote, yeah, well, they're they're still part of the organization, but they're remote. And maybe those contractors, even if they've been working with us for years, well, they're even further removed. And you start to, as you say, instead of looking for how you can bring everybody together, you sort of tear it. Yeah, that's my total fear with some organizations. And when I've heard, it hasn't been any of my clients, but I've heard some of my colleagues talk about their clients um, with you know smaller to mid-sized organizations who are like, no, everybody has to be in the office or they're not going to be, as you said, counted as, as, as the inner tier or whatever you want to call it. And that just makes my the hair on the back of my neck stand up because over time, we know that's what's going to, what it's going to do for the to the organization. Oh, yeah. And it's not going to be good. No, no, it's not. And I, I, I have to, in full disclosure, I always tell people I am the reform smoker of uh, virtual working because, I mean, once upon a time when I ran an organization and it's, it's some years back now, I, I hated people working from home. I always wanted everybody in the office as much as possible or in one of the satellites or whatever. But over time, I've realized how virtual organizations where all the benefits of it and how wonderful it can be in hybrid organizations and and I think we owe it to people to, you want, you want your employees to be productive, right? 
So if them being happy and productive means that they work in a non-traditional you know, setup, well, so be it, embrace it rather than, as you say, if you just force everybody to come into the office, yeah, you're, you're going to end up with, you're not going to have the best people anymore. Right. You know, and when you figure out what, where that person is most productive and what really is valuable to that individual, you know, that's what it's all about. As we were talking about at the beginning, you know, in, in terms of how people want to be communicated to people have different motivations. So, and your motivation is going to be different than mine and everybody else's. So if I'm more motivated with a hybrid and I come in sometimes and not, and you don't, then if you're going to have that organization, then figure it out, embrace it and, and help make it work for everybody. I mean, that really is what it comes down to. Yeah. And, and that's, that's, yeah. And that is my, my biggest fear too, is that I think, uh, uh, some organizations will just want to get back to the way it was and uh, as fast as they can and look at all of this is, te is temporary as opposed to looking at what are the advantages of this and how can I actually and does and as you said have a conversation with your employees like what works best for them and for the company and if you put those together then you're more likely to have happy productive people. Well and my big thing is because I'm all about supporting uh, women you know, this has been affecting women more than everyone else, as, as, as we all know. So if you're doing that and saying to the women that they all have to come back and they're still taking care of whatever they're taking care of back at home, and they've been productive for the last almost two years, even while they were homeschooling and everything else that was going on, even though the kids are back, then, wow, you're really going to miss the boat. and You are really going to lose those really valuable employees. You know, I look at one of my clients who was always pretty much, especially in, in the area that I was I work with, kind of against remote working, but they, they had people all over the country. And some people it was okay to be remote because they traveled anyway, mm -hmm. but they're not making these other ones come back into the office or into the Chicago area anymore. Some people have actually moved because they don't have to be here anymore. So I'm like applauding. I'm going, yay, you see it now. Yeah. So. And I think and I think that's that's a, that's a huge thing that people are, are are overlooking and have overlooked. It started with the it started, I think, with the financial crisis is where a lot more people realize that why am I locating myself in a high cost area just to be able to commute into a company that could let me go in the morning? Right. Something right. could happen and I could be gone and I'm stuck with a high mortgage in a high cost area or stuck in a San Francisco in a two by four flat that's costing me a million dollars a second or something. Uh, and and I think people are more now going, you know what, I want a quality of life. I want to be somewhere where the cost of living suits me and then I'll find a job. I'll find a remote job if I. So it's kind of flipped. And I mm -hmm. think if you if, if, if companies don't realize that they're going to real they're going to suddenly find their talent pool shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Yeah, I mean, I, I do wonder some of the companies that are out there saying we can't find the talent. How, what are your requirements? Where are you looking for them? How are you trying to locate them? What are you doing to entice them and embrace them if, you know, as a remote worker, you know, somebody that, you know, is coming on board that may live, you know, six states away and might never come to the office type of a thing you know you have to figure all of that out because I know there's people out there I see it on these different forums that I'm part of all the time yeah and and the other thing as well I think we have to embrace as well is let me get back to your example earlier about okay so maybe you were at home you were homeschooling yeah your kids have gone back to school or whatever but maybe bringing them to school and collecting them from school is a huge thing and is going to have a big impact or maybe having breakfast with them or whatever having dinner with them so if that is going to make your life better and that's going to make you more productive and you can figure it out with your with your boss, the times, why not? Isn't it isn't it better that people are feeling happier and more fulfilled? Yeah, I mean, I it's funny, even back in the day, I remember in one of my um, early roles in my first company, we had an administrative assistant who she left every day right on time. Her work was done. And the woman who sat next to her kind of struggled a little bit. And I remember having a conversation with my boss at the time. He was like, well, you know, she doesn't stay. I was like, because her work's done. You know, she's productive. She gets done what she needs to get done for the day. So 
and she gets it done in the hours. So if somebody can get done what they need to get done during the day with taking those breaks that you just talked about, you know, to take the kids to school or pick them up or whatever it might be, as long as the work is getting done and deadlines aren't being missed, then, then you should embrace that. That's what I keep saying. Yeah, I, I agree with you. But unfortunately, sometimes people just get hung up on this idea, the quantity. You know, it's like, oh, that they, the, the people you were referring to, well, one of them stays to like six or seven. So they are more committed. And you say, well, right. no, they're actually less efficient. But that's, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So I think we have to reorient our, our thinking a lot of that and realize that some of the things that we require of people are really for our own self. I mean, they're to satisfy something in ourselves as opposed to if we look at it dispassionately or whatever that we realize, yeah, that's not really that important, probably. Well, and I think when we think kind of generation generationally, those of us who, you know, started working earlier in our careers and things like that, just because we had to do it that way doesn't mean that that's the way that it needs to be done now. And we need to be open to that. And that's kind of part of that where we talk, started talking about change. That's mm -hmm. kind of the change within ourselves of recognizing that, that people don't have to pay the same quote unquote dues that we paid early on in our careers. Yeah. I love that. That's perfect because yeah, I, I think that that's a, that's an issue. We probably all carry with us to some degree, you know, oh, I had to do it. So you have to do it and realizing, well, yeah, you don't because the world has changed and you know, you have your own challenges today that I didn't have. Right. Yeah. So listen, Alexis, this has been fantastic. Uh, time has flown here. Um, all of Alexis's information is going to be below this video uh, so you can get in contact with her. But before we go, please do tell us a little bit more about Intel Lead and yourself. Great. Thank you. So I do everything leadership development so and organizational change. So I do, I love working with organizations and individuals to um, take their leadership skills to the next level. So that might be everything from strategy to design and delivering training to executive coaching. And then I also work with my clients on organizational change things like we were just talking about, John. And what I really love is working with and helping women be a success because I have a real passion for gender equity. So that's kind of where I, where I uh, sit and what I like, love to do. And my client base is all over the world and all different types of organizations. So that's always fun too. Yeah. Well, it's good news as I'm hoping, obviously, with this, uh, you know, hybrid working and working development is uh, going on that there's going to be less and less barriers or less and less, you know, more opportunities for everybody to be involved and, you know, less barriers to it. And we, and we can work around the things that perhaps we weren't as willing to work around before. Absolutely. I think that would be great. I think we'll get there. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's necessarily going to be easy. No, no change is easy. Yeah. Yeah, no, I don't think it's going to be easy. And and it's uh, and as you said, I mean, part of it may be just because of people carrying that, uh, carrying their old biases through uh, just because the way they worked and the way they did things. And it, it's it's a challenge for everybody. But hey, it's an exciting time to be um, at the forefront of, of, of organizational change. So I would definitely anybody who is going through any change or, or or uh, leadership challenges or anything, you know, please do check out Alexis and her organization. So listen, thanks again. My name is John Golden. I will see you all again soon.